only 100 companies are responsible for over 70% of carbon dioxide emissions. So even if every single individual changes their lifestyle, we still have 70% of emissions being caused by these multinational companies. Hello, Mitsutan. Welcome here at uh, Studio Solidaire. It's an honor having you here at, uh, at Studio Solidaire at Manifiesta all the way from the Philippines. You're active in all kinds of climate organizations. When did you start again being a climate activist? It's hard for me to answer that question because I started being aware of the climate crisis as early as my childhood. Because it's something that in the Philippines you grow up with, seeing the typhoons and the floods. But I didn't become an activist until 2017 when I was able to talk to indigenous leaders of our land. Which age in 2017? I think I was 19. 19 years old. And how old, how old are you now? 24. 24. 24 and uh, traveling around the world to, to raise awareness about climate change. We're going to talk about uh, the perspective of the Global South on the issue of climate change. You've met with activists all over the world. And I was just wondering, do you think there is a big difference between being an activist here or in the Philippines between the reality you live and the reality we live here? I've noticed that with climate activists in the global north, there is a safety that the climate activists in the Philippines and global south countries don't have. A lot of our countries suffer from repression and fascist dictatorships. The democracies are not what they're like. And so that is one of the biggest differences that I've seen. And also just the way that climate change is talked about in the global north and the global south are very different especially when I was just starting out in the, in the international movement, I noticed how a lot of people saw that climate change was a problem of the future. I'm part of the Fridays for Future network, but even with the name Fridays for Future, it says that it's something that is about to come, not something that's already happening. Let's start there. Uh, it's already happening. We, we know the Philippines a bit from TV, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, uh, the, the images of uh, houses ripped uh, apart. Those extreme events, they are happening more and more often. We read it in the news. We, we know the reports. But how does it impact your life living in the Philippines? I grew up being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom. It's those nights where we had no electricity because of the winds outside. So I had to do my homework by the candlelight. And my story is already such a privileged one. There are urban poor communities, small farmers, small fisher folk, indigenous peoples, working class people who have it much worse. So that is the impact of the climate crisis on the Philippines. It means floods consuming communities and going up to the third floor of buildings and people being stranded on rooftops for days. But that also means that there's a lot of climate resistance. I think the, the last big example we know is, is Typhoon Haiyan. Do you see it? more often in, in, in your neighborhood, in your circle? Typhoon Haiyan was in 2013, but actually in 2020, there were four typhoons in the span of three weeks. And one of them was a typhoon that was stronger than Typhoon Haiyan. One of them was the strongest storm landfall in recorded history. And then one of them brought rain of worth one month in under 24 hours. And so all of that coming just right after each other meant that we couldn't adapt, we couldn't bounce back. And so it's gotten worse since then and it's continuously getting worse. It's incredible. We don't even hear it in the news here right, anymore, I think, because it happens so often. And, and yet, recently, a right-wing politician here in Belgium uh, said on, uh, in, a, in a talk show, Belgium only accounts for 0.24% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's, uh, it's true, the, the number is true, it's only 0.24%. So he said, what difference does it make to do those massive investments in renewable energy and uh, changing industry and so, and so on? What difference would it make for people in the, in, in the South? What would you respond to him with if he would be sitting here next to me? I think the way that he's counting his emissions are probably not counting the historical exploitation that the country has done on the Global South countries. And... I know that in a lot of European countries, they've exported the emissions by putting the factories that the multinational companies here own in global South countries, and that's why the emissions aren't counted. But then if you take into account all the products, all the resources that are being stolen from our countries to go into this country, not to serve the normal people, but really just to serve the richest of these countries also, then the numbers get a lot higher. Yes, so you have historical emissions, you have the, the exportation of emissions, but the question still is, and I think a lot of people struggle with it, you see those consequences of climate change now, it's enormous, but could it have an impact to, 
to do something now to to change the way we produce energy or, or products would it change your lives in the philippines it would change not just the lives of the philippines but also to change the lives of people here in belgium and in europe because even now people in europe are also experiencing the climate crisis and not just the philippines but across the world it's billions of people that are already experiencing it and so we need to make sure that we have that changes in um, the way we produce energy but also that the global north pays reparations for the historical and ongoing exploitation and that's through climate finance and a lot of climate finance now is in the form of loans so that means that our countries go into debt and we have a debt crisis because of the climate impacts that th these countries have caused and so there's a mismatch there and that has to be changed and how would you solve it then that cancellation is one crucial step especially during the time of the pandemic especially um, can debt that was for climate finance uh, and climate impacts rather and something that global north countries promised back in 2009 is that they would give 100 billion us dollars per year and that's so small and they still haven't been able to do it. And there's also a lot of talks about technology transfer, so not just money, but technology. How would it help a country like the Philippines? Technology transfer is so important because, as a concrete example, in the Philippines, the tip of this pen, we can't even produce it. We have all the minerals to do it, but then we don't have the machines and the industries to have the final product because our country has been deliberately stunted so that we wouldn't develop, so that global north countries can continuously take the cheap resources and our cheap labor and we remain dependent on them. You have been living, like you said, with the consequences of climate change all your life. And then you said, I became active in climate activism when I met uh, some indigenous people in, uh, in the Philippines. Can you tell me a bit more about that? In 2017, I was able to talk to a Lumad indigenous leader. He didn't tell me his name because the, the Philippines is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental defenders and activists. He told me about how they are being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed for protecting the planet. Then so simply he shrugged and chuckled. He laughed and said, eh, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And the simplicity of how he said it, the reality of the situation burst my bubble of privilege and I realized who am I to not join the struggle of our environmental defenders and activists? And I realized that at this point, none of us have a choice but to fight back. This is our planet. This is our home. It will affect everyone, not on the same level, of course, but it is something that will affect everyone. So we need everyone involved. There was a very big urge for him because he, he, he lived the, the consequences of climate change. And so, okay. And you, you said it's very, very dangerous being a... Uh, an activist in the, in, the, in the Philippines. What are the risks? Because here in Belgium, when we say it's risky, it means you can stay one night in jail or something. But what, what does it mean in the Philippines? In the Philippines, it means that if you get arrested, we have to follow the police car to make sure that they bring you to the precinct because sometimes you disappear. Before 2020, this has already been happening, but in 2020, a law called the anti-terror law was passed, which means that something as simple as system change, not climate change, can make you a terrorist. And that means you can be under surveillance for 90 days without you knowing. You can be picked up without a warrant and you can be disappeared. And that is one of the reasons why it's so dangerous. And then it's gotten even more dangerous now because our new president, Marcos, is the son of the dictator from 50 years ago, who was the most dangerous for activists, environmental defenders, and has had the highest killings of people in general of the Philippines. And now that fascist dictatorship family is back in power through cheating and disinformation to the people. And do you have friends or colleagues or people around you that have been yeah, affected by this? Earlier this year, a good friend who helped me realize that I wanted to be a full-time activist um, was killed. He was a volunteer teacher to the indigenous peoples and an environmental defender. His name was Chad Bo'ok. And the government said that he is a terrorist, a part of the rebel army, and so they killed him. That's uh, really sorry, I'm really sorry to hear. Maybe could you tell me a bit more about, you said you're a full-time climate activist. What does it mean? What do you do full-time then? Because you can't be marching full-time, I yes, imagine. Yes, yes. Um, that's actually one of the things that I want to break down about the image of activism, because a lot of people think that it's the protests, the talks, the conferences, but a lot of it is actually really boring Zoom meetings or 
reading graphs and papers, but a my favorite part of it is talking to people, organizing people, because I think more than campaigning and mobilizing, we have to make sure that people be part of the movement, that we organize so that people become part of a collective and we get stronger together. The solidarity and the unity becomes more than just about issues, but about people. And I can imagine that it's not easy to organize people around an issue like climate change, which is, although it is very concrete in, in the reality, yeah, we have poverty, we have work or not, not having work. There's a lot of problems for people. How do you arrive to yeah, organize people around a specific issue of, of climate change? Good question. I'm still trying to figure it out. No, I'm kidding. Um, something that I noticed is that because there's a lack of climate change awareness and empowering education, people don't realize that poverty, food security, work, it's connected to the climate crisis. And so what we do a lot is connecting with the unions, with the urban poor rights organizers, with the fisher folk, with the farmers, and then learning from them and seeing how our climate campaign can help their campaigns. We stand in solidarity with them because the climate change issue can fall under everything. We're the ones who goes to them and adjusts to them. And is it also because in Belgium, in Europe in general, I think it's mostly youth who are the yeah the, the energizing factor in the in the climate movement, especially since uh, 2019? Is it the same in the, in the Philippines? It is the same in the Philippines, where the climate movement is mostly youth. But then we work a lot with our environmental defenders, who are the farmers, the fisher folk, and they have elders, they have older people in there. And I think that it's important to recognize that intergenerational aspect of it, so that. The older people, they have to be involved, right? Because it's not the older generation's fault. It's the very specific 1% of the older generation that's at fault. Can you elaborate that a bit more? Who is the responsible then if it's not, not the elder people? Because we heard, hear that a lot eh, from young people. The old people, they, uh, they fucked up and now we have to uh, clean up the mess. Who is responsible then? Because it's not the old people. The older working class didn't cause the climate crisis. It's the multinational companies. It's the fossil fuel industries. It's the global north government, not everyone. It's the lack of political will that's causing the climate crisis. That's causing not just the climate crisis, but really the capitalist system that's brought us to the climate crisis. And that has to be changed in order to solve climate crisis. And is that also why, because I looked in your social media in uh, interviews you did uh, earlier on, I, I saw you put a strong emphasis on the fact that changing individual behavior will not be enough. I think that's because you say it's linked to the system then. Yeah, I know in Belgium there are big groups that talk a lot about individual lifestyle change being the solution to the climate crisis, but only 100 companies are responsible for over 70% of carbon dioxide emissions. So even if every single individual changes their lifestyle, we still have 70% of emissions being caused by these multinational companies. And individual lifestyle change isn't accessible to everyone because it's expensive to live a life like that. And so that is what we need to change. For example, in the Philippines, because here we have more luxury, more wealth, and it's, it's easier, not for everyone, but it's easier for some people to make other changes in life. I imagine it's different in the Philippines. To have a zero waste lifestyle, to be vegan or to be vegetarian, it's, it's very difficult because there's not a lot of opportunities and choices. But it also means that if you do have the privilege, if the opportunity is there, you should take it. Individual lifestyle change can help, but it's like 0.1% of help. Because I saw you had a refillable bottle with you. Uh. <laughs> Uh, in 2019, you founded Fridays for Future. In uh, the Philippines. Who founded it? In the Philippines, of course. It was a time of the, the, the big climate strikes all over the world. How did it look like in your country in 2019? People didn't know what the climate crisis was. A lot of people thought it was just a science subject. They didn't realize that what we were already experiencing as a community, as a country, was the climate crisis. There were a lot of misconceptions. We talked to a lot of students. Some of them said that it's oxygen that's causing the climate crisis. You know, there's a lot of misinformation. And so that is what we had to really work on and change. And we, we couldn't even use the name Fridays for Future because no one knew who it was. That's why our name was Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, because we needed the word climate in it so that people would understand. Okay. And then, as, as we said earlier, in, in Europe, it was mostly youth, youth who was uh, mobilizing at that time. In, in Belgium, we had, we had demonstrations every week. Was it the same or did it take other forms in the Philippines? 
we didn't do protests every Friday because no one understands that. No one would know. And it was also a, a security risk for us to do that every week, if, especially if it's in small numbers. So what we did instead was going to a lot of students and talking to them and going to schools and talking about the climate crisis, raising awareness and empowering people with that information and education, and then bringing students to the frontline communities so that we could learn from them. So it's much more has has been much more an uh, an educational movement than the the mobilizing movement we have seen here in the beginning it was that and then once people were educated that's when we would mobilize so it was one let's say in a month three weeks of educating and then at the end of the month mobilizing and then you did a big march and still arrived to have people there or yes okay we so uh, as I said, we also had an, uh, uh, yeah, quite an, an, emor an enormous uh, climate movement in Belgium. We had school strikes every week. We had uh, tens of thousands of people in the street every week, and although it had impact, it didn't really change climate policy. It's not that we are saving the climate now. It made a few people conclude that mass mobilization doesn't work, and they shifted towards we have to take more uh, actions of civil disobedience. And so you see it in London, people are gluing themselves to the, to the subway and stuff like that. What's your opinion on the matter? How do you see it? I think it depends on the country and the understanding of people. Civil disobedience, I find that such a difficult term because for us, a banner drop is a civil disobedience. A protest in the street could be civil disobedience in the Philippines. So I've never really understood the concept of it. And I don't really understand the concept of deliberately being arrested because it's not the reality in the Philippines. But if it works here, then it works. But my question is, in the mass mobilizations, were there concrete demands? That's one of the of the of the problems I think there there were in in 2019 we had elections in uh, in May and so a, a big part of the movement focused themselves on we need the green government and in the end the greens didn't win and so they were disappointed then they they, they shifted and wanted a climate law one climate law would solve it all it didn't arrive either that deceived a lot of people and I think the the question of what do you demand what do you put on the table what are you fighting for it's it's a very important one yeah and to have concrete objectives and and not just we need a climate government, what is a climate government? Exactly. So maybe that's why the mass mobilizations didn't work. It's part of the, of the, of the answer why it didn't work. Also, the pandemic came uh, just uh, after it. And I think it's dangerous that people think mass mobilization doesn't work anymore, because I think in history, also in the Philippines, we have seen that that is what changes society yeah, after yeah. all. I think civil disobedience should be a tool to get people outside and join the mass mobilizations. Yeah, that's an interesting point of view. Because the problem is if all activists focus on the acts of civil disobedience, there's no one left to organize the masses. Exactly. And uh, it's and difficult to... How will people join you and how will you grow? Exactly. Another question, alongside the climate crisis, there's now also the energy crisis sweeping uh, the globe. Uh, people are getting afraid of being unemployed, uh, factories closing. To your opinion, doesn't focusing on the climate now, demanding to stop big polluters, yeah, doesn't it make things worse for some people? That's what we're made to believe, because we're made to believe that the fossil fuel industry is the only way, but it's not. Especially countries like in, in the European Union, the countries are capable of transitioning into renewable energies without sacrificing workers. But that has to be so important, which means the climate movement needs to work very closely with the workers and with the unions so that you're able to do this. And without that crucial connection, you will end up leaving the workers, which are part of the most marginalized groups. Problems we still have in the climate movement that we didn't make the link with the, with the workers' movement. You spoke a lot about people in the front lines, uh, the peasants and the, and the fishermen. Is it possible to work together with the unions in the, in the Philippines on the climate yes, change they're also front? Part of, they're also part of the people that we work with a lot because we realize that without these groups, we end up proposing climate solutions that are similar to the government because you don't work with the people who are most marginalized, with the people who are left behind. And so you have to actively make sure that, for example, here you work with the refugees, with the people of color, with the immigrants, because these are the people who are constantly being forgotten and left behind by the government. Mm -hmm. but there's people who, who are left behind, but I think the unions and the working class they also have a big power because they work in the in the in the, in the yeah. industry and in the energy plants. We have to we have to change. Or I think it's important to have them 
exactly. connected to climate change struggle to be able to change things. Exactly, because I've seen a lot of people say that the energy workers are the enemies of climate movement, which they're not. We should be working with them because they're also being impacted with their health, with the energy work that they're doing. Yeah, we had a very interesting experience when we went to the uh, climate summit in uh, Warsaw in 2013, I think. There was a big um, contradiction between the climate movement and the uh, coal workers in, uh, in Warsaw. The coal workers actually planned to attack the climate march there until we until we we have to sit around one table and, and discuss how we would uh, yeah how we would organize a uh, not just climate just okay, climate justice also also social justice and good jobs for the people who are working in industries that are not very future proof at the moment you were also at the climate summit in glasgow last yes. year i was there too i have to say it was uh, quite a disappointment yeah uh, <laughs> did you feel the same yeah i felt like it was The funny thing is I went into COP26 knowing that it wouldn't solve the problem because COP26, it's a tool of the capitalist and imperialist system that brought the climate crisis. And so it's not going to solve the climate crisis. But I expected at least a little bit of reforms, a little bit of something, but it was just, there was nothing there. And it was also like the setting. I arrived there. I remember I was looking for a chair and they were, were all sponsored by IKEA. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a... The fossil uh, fuel companies. All just... the fossil fuel companies sponsoring the, the 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 summit, and I was like, "What am I doing? What am I doing?" So I got out to the climate march. How do you see the the interaction between the climate movement and those summits? Because in the end, it's there where world leaders are around the table. I think the UN climate summits are crucial pressure points to one move leaders, but also for the public opinion to change because that is when media is looking, that is when everyone is looking. And so we need that critical mass opinion to change so that people care about the climate crisis and understand it. And so it is for me a tool to get more reforms, but also to educate more people so that they mobilize and that they organize. So a moment in the year you can work around to organize, educate. Exactly. Because we have a manifestation here the 23rd of October, but I think it's Yeah, it's just before the summit in um, Sharm el Sheikh. I yes. think it is in Egypt. So uh, important, uh, important to be there. Maybe you, you talked a few times already about imperialism, capitalism. Can you go a bit deeper into what you mean by that system and how it affects climate? The capitalist and imperialist system means that everything that's being done is for profit, which means that overproduction is happening. And so the limited resources of the planet are being ignored. This dream of everlasting growth, of everlasting economic growth for the 1%, it's, that's, that's what it is, a dream. Nothing else on the planet has that continuous growth except cancer cells. Trees stop at a certain point. You know, everything stops at a certain point when we have enough, when everyone has what they need. But that's not what's happening. It's just profit, 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 growth, growth, growth for the 1%. And everyone else is left behind. And different levels. Some people are more privileged. Some people have more comfort. But then everyone is still left behind in some way. That is what led us to the climate crisis. Because of that overproduction, because of we keep getting from the planet without understanding that we are part of the planet and we are part of the ecosystem. And a very concrete example is how the U.S. military is one of the biggest polluters and contributors to the climate crisis. Excluded in the international excluded uh, treaties. Excluded in the international treaties. They're not counted. And what do they do? They invade countries for oil, which is the fossil fuel industry. And that's what you mean with imperialism. Then. Exactly. And a concrete example also with imperialism and, and uh, is how the EU has a comprehensive agrarian program, which lots of things happening in there. But uh, the imperialism part is how Because of the program, there are tax subsidies. And so the African farmers, they suffer. Um, and in the Philippines... Because of products produced cheap in the Europe, exported yes, towards exactly. Africa. And then exactly. And it's similar in the Philippines where when there are typhoons, uh, the US and European countries have given foreign aid. And in exchange, there are neoliberal policies that are passed. Even if a typhoon passes, they give aid and you have to change... Policies. They give aid so that we change our policies. And then you have to raise retirement agents and, exactly. and stuff like that. I was scrolling through your uh, Instagram page on my way here, and I saw you posted this quote. I quote, At the risk of seeming ridiculous, let me say that a true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. 
it is impossible to think of a genuine revolutionary lacking this quality. That's a quote from uh, Che Guevara, the Cuban uh, revolutionary. Why is this important for you? Why do you post it on Instagram? I think a lot of people have seen activists as angry and sad and afraid. Big signs exactly. in the streets. Exactly. But if you look into it, it comes from that feeling of love, love for the people, the 99%, not all the people, but the 99%, love for solidarity. And I think when we elevate our campaigns, when we elevate our unity into this revolutionary love, that's also how we make sure that we don't cancel people, that we don't leave people behind just because they don't understand everything. You're more patient with them. You stick to them and you want the movement to grow because there is that love and you know that it is for the betterment of society. I think that's very important what you're saying because I, I talk a lot to climate activists who are disappointed in people who are who don't understand the problem, who don't act yet, who are worrying about other problems. And as you say, it's, love brings also patience. Yeah, because it's not their fault that they don't know and they don't understand. The system taught us to, to think that way. No one is born a revolutionary. I used to be so apolitical and apathetic, you know? Like, if the activists around me gave up on me, I wouldn't be here. That's an important lesson. And speaking about you, we've been talking now half an hour, you have lived a life filled with typhoons, with violence, with uh, ignorance. And yet, I have to say, you radiate energy, happiness, joy. How do you do it? What is your secret? I know that I'm not alone in this. I am only joining the struggle of environmental defenders who are already so strong. And that is where I get my energy. And then you remember that there is someone in every country fighting for the same thing that we are. We are seeing global movements. We're seeing international solidarity now more than ever. It just needs to be elevated into talking about imperialism, talking about capitalism. But there's this excitement in me knowing that we will achieve great things. That's uh, very confident. Talking about uh, capitalism, imperialism, there is a slogan that you have in every climate march in Belgium and I imagine also in the Philippines, that is system change, not climate change. Change the system, not the climate. We talked about a system that's capitalism, imperialism. But then the question is, what do we have to change it for? This is always a tricky question because certain answers will get me in trouble in the Philippines. But, you know, for me, you can call it a tamarau, you can call it a banana. It doesn't matter what it's called as long as it's one that is pro-people, it is planned and needs-based, and it is equitable, and it's the people who are in power, it's the working class that are in power, and not the 1%, not the riches that are in politics today. We have to make sure that the world that we're building is one that leaves no one behind. And some people say that that's idealistic, and, and I think, why is it idealistic to think that it is possible to have a world where everyone is safe? You know, that is the bare minimum that we're asking for. We need a world where people aren't working from eight to five to get so little. You know, it's, it's these things. And if you say uh, a society where working class people rule not the 1%, is there a guarantee that they will take climate serious, the, the climate more serious than, uh, than the 1% at this time? at this moment. But that's why we organize and we talk to the workers' movement even now, so mm -hmm. that, that we have that society. Mm -hmm. Something that also has to do with society is the fact that there's a lot of emphasis on the fact that climate change deepens equalities. It deepens the differences between rich and poor, between countries like the Philippines and, and the EU. But also, it increases the inequality between men and women, I read on your uh, socials. Can you explain what you mean by that? Especially since 80% of poor people are women, so there is that class aspect to it as well. But gender injustice means that during times of extreme weather events, women and children are more prone to harassment and violence. Um, you see very, that in the, in the Philippines. Yes, a very concrete example that you mentioned earlier is Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. The typhoon devastated the community so much that even after, long after the typhoon was gone, young girls and women were forced into prostitution because there was no other choice. And so you took that choice away from them. And that was because there was economic hardship. And so that is the example of uh, the climate crisis, the economic crisis, and gender injustice um, intersecting. Intersecting and, and aggravating each, yeah. each other. 
it's uh, it's affecting people all over the world. Climate change. We we had very severe, severe floods in uh, in Belgium last year, in July, uh, and, uh, and and other towns uh, around, which were devastating, but also caused an enormous wave of solidarity. Thousands of people coming from all over the country to to help people uh, empty. Uh, their houses, clean houses, rivers, uh, rebuild. We created with the uh, Workers' Party the Solidarity Teams to try to organize it, to be able to, to send a lot of people uh, to, to help. Of course, the, the impact of climate change is a lot heavier in the Philippines than in uh, Belgium. We don't have typhoons here. We had one big storm uh, a year ago. But do you have the same kind of, of solidarity initiatives there? We have this term called Bayanihan, which means for the greater good. And that's exactly what it is, that solidarity, that community. I think whenever there is oppression and whenever there is injustice, there's resistance and solidarity. It will always happen. It's always there. And that's exactly what we have in the Philippines when there are typhoons. Even people who aren't activists, people who are apolitical and apathetic, don't know anything, they will come and help because they see that there is something that's happening to our community that is wrong. And, and also so because of the fact that the government... The government does nothing. So, yes, exactly. That's one thing that's the same in uh, Belgium and the Philippines then. <laughs> we have a great world. <laughs> <laughs> May I uh, ask you one last question? That is, what is your biggest dream? My biggest dream is to create a world where people feel safe. Whenever people ask me, what does climate justice look like? I say climate reparations, just transition. But I like to tell people what climate justice feels like. It's that moment when you're happiest and you feel safe. It's that moment when you're not worried about anything and that you know that you are secure. But that moment for everyone. It means a world where there is no injustice. And it's not just a dream, it is like something that will happen. Not through me, but through collective action, led by the most marginalized people. Thanks a lot, Mitsita. Thank you so much. <laughs>